I'd like to welcome everybody back to Alabama Care today. I have the absolute pleasure of being in Homewood, Alabama, and I really appreciate you guys being in this location because sometimes I do a decent amount of traveling throughout the state um, for these broadcasts, and I live in McCalla, Alabama, so this is only about half hour away, uh, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> and I am here today with Mrs. Dana Barber, um, and Dana Barber is the State Coordinator for Blind Services. Uh, Yolanda Smith, Dana Barber here, Yolanda Smith um, is the Orientation and Mobility Specialist for Blind Services, uh, and also Mary Gates, and Mary is the Vision Rehabilitation Assistant. Um, and I know I just introduced you guys, I'm going to go ahead and hand it right back over, and I'm going to allow yourself to introduce you. Uh, Mrs. Barber, if you would start. Hello everyone, I'm Dana Barber, and um, as Alex said, I am the State Coordinator of Blind Services for the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services. And um, how long have you been working with Blind Services? I've been working with Blind Services for probably, well, since 2006, so 13 years. 13 years. Um, now, did you have any connection with the mental health community before that, or um, give me a little bit of history there. Are you okay. Well, not with mental health, but with, with, with blindness. Um, yes, very much. Um, actually, I'm totally blind myself. I lost vision over the years. Uh, actually was a product of the services that our agency provides. And so uh, through that opportunity, I was able to uh, get the education that I needed and be able to come to work for the agency. Yes, yeah, so through your experience, you really have a first-hand account of what someone uh, really needs, and you're able to kind of take your experience back into serving people. Yes, and it really does make a difference. Yeah, I imagine that there's a really strong connection there for people that are looking for services and supports and being able to, um, you know, yes, you know yes, yes. have that connection there. Yes. Um, Mrs. Smith. Hi. Uh, if you would just go ahead and reintroduce yourself. Okay, well, my name is Yolanda Smith. Um, I'm an orientation and mobility specialist with the Alabama Department of Oak Rehab Services here in Homewood. Um, I've been in the field for about seven years now. Um, and what really uh, attracted you to this field? Um, actually, I'm a second generation orientation mobility specialist. Um, I graduated uh, back in 2012 uh, from Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas. Um, got an opportunity to do my internship at the VA in downtown Birmingham. Um, from there, got an opportunity, I'm currently, like I said, working here in the, in the Birmingham area, um, but I had an opportunity to work uh, in the state of Georgia, uh, teaching orientation mobility skills, uh, training, and um, like I said, pretty much my father, being a second generation orientation mobility specialist, that's the reason I got into the field. Yeah, so you kind of grew up knowing what was expected and how, how it worked there, and it was a natural fit. Exactly. Uh, very cool. Uh, and Mrs. Gates, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yes, um, I'm Mary Gates. I'm Dana Barber's vision rehabilitation assistant, which means that I drive her wherever she needs to go, just whatever she needs, I kind of am there to help her. And um, my background, I am dyslexic. So I kind of grew up knowing about ARS, which is Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services. And um, it's really helped me realize what I wanted to do, and Dana's really helped me realize what I want to do. And I just, this agency is so easy to fall in love with, I feel like. Yeah, so you kind of had some experience there. I'm going to hook up another mic because I think I can get two mics coming through. If you can get my backpack. <coughs> and why, why I'm doing this, I'm going to give an introduction for all of us personally, but if you could give me an introduction of blind services and orientation and mobility. I'll start off with blind services, Mrs. Barber. Yes, um, well blind services falls under the big umbrella of the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services and under the division then of deaf and blind services. And so our goal is to help Alabamians with a visual disability to uh, become independent or and employed and we're going to offer those services to our consumers and treat them with respect and dignity 
And within our blind services department, we have a lot of professionals who are there to assist. We have our counselors who are kind of like the, the hub of, of what we do. They're oftentimes the first contact. And so when a, someone in the state of Alabama realizes they have a vision loss that is impeding their ability to become employed, then they contact us and they contact a counselor or they may contact a vision rehabilitation therapist or an orientation and mobility specialist who are other professionals who work within our division and we all work together to offer the services to those citizens in Alabama who want to work so that they are able to go back to work or work for the first time to provide for themselves and for their families. Now, I know a lot of um, a lot is focused about around employment right now, um, but blind services are available to all ages, even if you're not looking for employment. Our, agen our agency uh, focuses on we can start as working with students as young as 14, and then we work with adults all through the age of employment. As long as they want to work and they need our services, we are there to help. So really the full um, lifespan there from, you know, yes. early intervention all the way through? Yes. And then even after we have a division of, um, it's called OASIS, and it's our older blind program. And we even offer services through our OASIS program for age-related vision loss. And uh, maybe they're not going to be working but we can offer services for them in their homes oh yeah and is there some um, technical assistance there as well well let's bridge right into uh, mrs. Smith if you would give us a little bit of background on orientation and mobility um, as an orientation mobility specialist I pretty much I teach travel skills I mean probably see people travel or walk around with a long cane or even use a guide dog uh, guide dog is considered a mobility uh, tool um, but I teach those individuals how to get safely from point A to point B by utilizing that device. Um, when we initially uh, meet, I guess, a, a consumer, a client, potential, um, we do an assessment. Uh, within that assessment, we determine what their needs are, what their goals are. Um, we go out, um, I observe them to see how they currently get around, and from there, uh, we develop a plan and uh, start teaching the skills based on that plan. Mm. Um, skills start off with basic skills. Uh, there is a technique called sighted guide. You may sighted guide? Sighted guide. Mm -hmm. That's a technique that we teach individuals before we put a cane in their hand. And that's where you have a human person guiding you. Mm. So it's like they're your eyes. So they're helping you get safely to where you need to go. Um, there's self-protection techniques that we actually uh, teach students, systematic search patterns. Skills just start getting a little bit more advanced. I put a cane in your hand. I teach you how to use it both indoors and then outdoors, um, Dana mentioned that we do teach students of all ages. Uh, we do some campus orientation. Um, so we do teach students on campus uh, how to get around to their classrooms, things like that. Mm. Grocery store travel, access and public transportation, and even with some of our seniors, um, introducing them to things like uh, attending the senior center. Mm. Um, so that's the gist of teaching those skills. But safety is priority, and it's teaching them how to be confident in using their cane. And about how long does that process take? Everyone's different, so it varies. We do have totally blind students that we work with, as well as individuals that are um, low vision. Mm. Um, there are a total of six orientation mobility specialists throughout the state of Alabama that I am here in central Alabama. So you do a decent amount of traveling, and when you're doing these, is it is it classes or is it very individual based? It's individual based, so it's one on one instruction. Mm. Um, so again, based on that plan that we initially developed for that uh, student, um, we teach those skills based on that plan. Mm. So again, it could be just a, a senior. Um, that senior may have issues with um, support and balance. And so we teach them how to get around safely, even in their home. We do that. Um, it's community type instruction. 
uh, like I said, we've done some campus orientation, you know, traveling downtown, we've done that. So I think that's really cool that you guys go into the home or wherever that environment is, um, instead of coming into like a conference room and being like, well, this is how you use this stick or, you know, that kind of thing. So they can really get a feel for it in, in a natural environment. Uh, we see that in other parts of ADRS and mental health as well, where I think, it, you know, going into the person's living environment and really getting a feel for what, what needs to be done. Uh, so. Um, and Mrs. Gates, if you would uh, just kind of give a little history about Vision Rehab Assistance. Um, basically, we, per, I've only been in this job for almost a year now. And it's just learning about what you're, everybody's different. Everybody prefers to be assisted in a different way. And I've learned that working with Miss Dana. Uh, Miss Dana usually prefers me to be a sighted guide to her, and you just have to know, do people want to be super independent? Do they want to depend on a sighted guide? Um, really, it's just getting to know what, who needs what and how to ask people. If you see somebody walking down the street and they're blind and they look like they need assistance, how you need to approach them and how you need to ask them, um, do you mind if I reach out and touch you? Do you, mind, do you want to grab my arm? You just have to learn. Yeah, so that would be something that I'm unfamiliar with. Mm -hmm. If I noticed somebody that was, um, I thought needed assistance crossing the street, I wouldn't know how to approach that subject. I wouldn't have a year ago. And I so what is the it. proper etiquette there? Uh, Mrs. Barber, um, what would be proper etiquette? Just to ask. Yeah. Say, uh, don't try to grab someone and say, oh, no, don't do that. Just ask. We'll tell you what we need. Yeah. yeah. How did that relationship, I imagine it's kind of awkward at first. Um, between you two, but it kind of grows and becomes very natural there. It does, it does. Um, I've actually known Mary all of her life. Uh, she is actually the daughter of my hairdresser. Okay. And so uh, when I would be in the, the shop, Mary would be there toddling around. <laughs> <laughs> you know all her stories. <laughs> we don't have to air them out today. <laughs> but of course, Mary is very easy to, to fall in love with. And I, I knew of Mary's involvement with our agency through the years. And um, her mother and I were very close and we would talk about what Mary's future plans were. And then just so happened about the time Mary was graduating from high school, I needed a to hire um, an assistant yeah and so I contacted Mary and asked if it was something she thought she might be interested in doing and she was very excited about the opportunity and so uh, she's been very um, easy to work with and most people think that we're mother and daughter <laughs> so we just go with that I, just, uh, I do have two daughters uh, and, and so, so I, I just, just claim Mary as my third daughter. There you go. <laughs> and, you know, we just spend a lot of time together. Mm. And, and it needs to be a, a, a relationship. Mm. And uh, Mary and I do have that. That's a t I imagine it's a tough relationship to um, kind of find the boundaries there because it is... Uh, friendship, but also a job. It is you. You have to make sure that you're doing your job correctly. And sometimes I see that um, I'm executive director of a community home for a family member of mine, um, and I always encourage the caregivers to have a nice, friendly relationship, like a motherly relationship with my aunt. Um, but if you, they go too far that way, then some of the house duties don't get taken care of. The cleaning doesn't get taken care of. So it's. You know, when you're with Bridget, I want you to have that motherly compassion there, but this is also a job. Um, and I imagine those boundaries, you know, they work themselves out. They do. They do. And, and I never want to treat Mary as if she is a child. Mm. And uh, I, I refer to Mary as my coworker, and she is. Then you've, said, you've mentioned that multiple times before we went live as coworker, and I think that's a really good word that sums that up. Um, it's a friendly, welcoming word, but it also is, you know, uh, a job kind of word as well. It is, it is. Mary is essential to my success. Now, are, um, are vision rehabilitation assistance available to anybody that qualifies? Are there... Um, our agency is one of very few who even offer this as a courtesy. Um, they, you know, if, if we're not going to hire people who have a disability, who is? Mm. 
You know, we've got to set that example, I, I feel. And for us to be able to do our jobs as a professional on a statewide basis, sometimes the, the public transportation is just not available. Mm -hmm. And so for us to be able to, to get to where we need to be and be there on time, um, our agency does offer vision rehabilitation assistance as a courtesy for those who have a visual disability. Um, and everybody in the agency does not have one, and everybody doesn't have a one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. we, we have several within the agency and several professionals share someone to help with the transportation need. Hmm. Now, you, you mentioned as a courtesy there, um, if someone needed a rehabilitation assistant, uh, is that an out-of-pocket cost, or how does that work? Um, Mary's job is a 40-hour-a-week state job, just like mine is. Hmm. So that's, um, that's not out of the consumer's pocket, then, that, that's from the state helping that person? Yes. Okay. Mrs. Gates, would you close the blinds um, on this window? Yep. I'd appreciate that. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, Mrs. Smith, we're honing back in. Um, what did you think about what Mrs. Barber and Mrs. Gates were talking about there? And um, like if someone had uh, some vision difficulties, would they come through you in finding a rehabilitation assistant? Or is that, what's the process there? We get referrals from all over the place. Um, Dana mentioned that um, we have counselors. Mm -hmm. um, so our counselors will send referrals to, uh, to an orientation mobility person, such as myself. Um, I get referrals from the UAB Low Vision Clinic, and that's because I'm centralized here in, in Birmingham. Um, but they come from all over. They may come from hospitals, from doctors, different doctors' offices. Um, but that's simply or normally how that process works. Normally, intake comes from uh, professionals in the medical community. That's correct. Uh, referrals there, and then uh, they'll have a uh, like a script kind of thing and saying, "Yes, this person definitely needs services." They send them to us um, based on their visual diagnoses. Mm -hmm. um, they feel uh, that that consumer or that potential client may need services in orientation mobility. Uh, we also have vision rehabilitation teachers. The vision, re the vision rehabilitation teachers, or therapists rather, um, they teach uh, home management type skills. So they do a lot of things that are inside the home uh, with cooking and cleaning, uh, medication management. Um, that's normally their area of expertise. Um, I'm more so I'm on the outside in teaching those independent living skills um, for, as it relates to travel outside the home. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to dive in a little bit um, about vo VR, vocational rehab and employment. Um, this is a big thing that is coming, uh, that the government is pushing and I think everybody really wants to go to work and, and work during the day and come home and feel proud about what you've done during that day. Um, what are some of the major, or I'd say main, difficulties that someone that has uh, vision loss would have in finding employment? What do you see? The biggest barrier to employment for people with vision loss is transportation. Okay. In a nutshell. Now is that um, from the home to the place of employment? Yes. That, that commute right there? Yes. How do we fix that? If you were to do a magic wand, what would it look like? Um, maybe the Jetsons Sky Travel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know and, and Uber and Lyft are really helping. Those kinds of services are really helping, but those are still not available in rural areas. Mm. Um, I live 34 miles from where I work, yeah. and I don't drive. And I live in a rural area where Lyft and Uber are not available. And so I had to reach out and find someone who was working in the area and lives in the community. Mm -hmm. And I carpool with them, but I don't carpool, I don't drive. I know y'all are glad to hear that. Uh, I do not drive, but I pay her for my um, transportation needs. And so she's my plan A, and I have a plan B, and I have a plan C. Because when you, to work, you've gotta be able to get there. And you can't be, absent and you can't be late mm -hmm. so you have to have all these plans in place but transportation is a huge barrier um, the need to, uh, for assistive technology is a, a 
uh, is, is a barrier. barrier. It's, it's not, not only the, the need to have it, but the ability to use it. What exactly is assistive technology? What are a few examples there? Assistive technology for people who are blind is basically a device that talks mm. to you. We have uh, software on our computers that we use that uh, are called, they're called screen readers. Mm. So anything that's on the computer screen, it will read to us. And we don't use a mouse to access that. We use keystrokes. So there's a huge learning curve there with how to, how to learn to use the software. Um, uh, cell phones are assistive technology devices for smartphones. Those, especially the iPhone, and it has a voiceover feature. So my cell phone reads my emails to me, reads my text messages. It allows me to send emails and text messages and allows me to um, program the phone myself with the contacts that I have. And I know who the incoming call is from because it, it tells me as the phone rings, it tells me who's calling. Now, does any phone, uh, iPhone, Android, have the capability to do that? Or are there certain companies that you would suggest going with? I think Apple leads the way with the iPhone, and that's the only phone that I'm familiar with that I've actually used, but Androids do have uh, the capability, I hear, as well. Now, is it just a, uh, like a feature I can go into settings and my phone can do that as well, or is it something yes. I need to download? It is a setting. Really? It's in with, within accessibility, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is haptic feedback, is that something that uh, a phone or, or technology helps with as well? Haptic is more for deaf blind, mm. and um, there I have noticed the setting on there for the haptic, um, but I'm not... It's not something you feel like. I don't use it, Yeah. so um, I'm not as familiar with it. Um, it's kind of, a few years ago, I was living in Arizona, um, and I'd taken a few classes at Arizona State University. Uh, I was more in the business at that point. But um, I was doing some work. I cannot remember the name of the organization. It was an ASU organization, but I was transcribing pictures in textbooks uh, for blind students. And the it was a big learning curve for me because you'd have, I, I ended up using like the clock, you know, um, the mitochondria is at 12 o'clock and those kinds of things. And it was a huge learning curve for me. One thing that I was a little frustrated with is I felt like each college campus had their own organization for that. There were about 10 of us in a room and we were all transcribing, you know, you come in between classes and, and do your works kind of that stuff. Um, but then, you know, University of Texas had their own team as well. And I felt like if the textbooks are the same, then you should allow the students to, you know, maybe follow a transcriber if they really connect with them. And that system wasn't there. This is an off-topic thing. But uh, I, I don't know if it, they've currently got a nationwide, you know, sharing these transcriptions or what have you. But I remember that back at ASU is, is um, looking at the picture and trying to communicate what's happening in that picture through words. And that is so helpful to those of us who cannot see the, uh, the graphic. Mm. Um, I know that on my iPhone now, you know, there's that um, artificial intelligence mm -hmm. that will describe, you know, it may say it's a picture of a child and a lake. Uh, Wait a second. I, this is all new to me. I didn't know that the, the smartphones will do that. Yes, they do. They do. And they, they really do recognize faces um, as far as my family goes. Um, my, my mother, mother is 86, 86 years old, and she's, she's not a Facebook or, or anything. So, so she's, she, she, she doesn't, doesn't have an account, but I have relatives who are, and, and the artificial, artificial intelligence will recognize my, a cousin of mine and as, um, as family members. As, fam as, as family members. Really? Yes. And call, I call out a name. That's kind of creepy in a way. It's kind of. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really cool. cool. Yeah. It's really cool. That's super cool. So if there's ever a picture of my mom, it will recognize her as a cousin of mine who is a Facebook person. Yeah. It's just so cool. <laughs> Um, now, Mrs. Smith, Mrs. Barber mentioned that transportation is the number one impo uh, most important thing when it comes to uh, employment. What are some of the things there um, that are set up as systems for people that are looking for help in transportation? As an orientation mobility specialist, we, we sit down with that consumer and we determine what, like I said, their goals and their needs are. Um, for someone like Dana mentioned that's interested in going back to work, that's really, really important. Um, so we 
we look at Google Maps sometimes, you know, um, when we sit down with the students to determine how to get from point A to point B. You know, what form of transportation are they going to need? Are they going to uh, use Uber? Are they going to use Lyft? Are they going to use their family members? Here in Birmingham, um, we do have a relationship with uh, the transportation company, Max, the Max uh, Birmingham Transit Systems. So they're really good. Um, there's also door-to-door -door transportation services. They're called paratransit. Um, Max has a service like that. Um, Class Trans also has a service like that. And every city and every state is different. Um, but we just, we sit down and we talk about and we discuss how are you going to get to your job, you know. And that's different for, for everyone. Um, you know, we teach routes. You know, we look at the schedule. Uh, we go online and we view the schedule to see how, how often that bus runs. You know, I always encourage my students, you know, when we talk about time management, you have to plan ahead. You know, some of those things you can't just go run outside, get in the car and go to your job anymore. So you have to step back and pre-plan all those things. And, and transportation is one of them. Now, as Mrs. Barber mentioned, that's great for um, downtown, but as soon as you get outside of downtown, the public transportation really drops off. Is there anything that is consistently reliable for sh like a shuttle service? Unfortunately, no. Um, that's just, the, I guess, the answer to that question. Um, is it feasible that there ever could be? Uh, every once in a while, um, Max, which is the, the Birmingham Transportation System, they'll have town hall meetings. And everyone comes together, they brainstorm to determine how can we make those transportation needs better mm. for folks with disabilities. Um, you know, there's still no magic thing that's, that they've come up with. Um, a lot of the systems are antiquated systems that people are using just, just for scheduling and things like that, and sometimes that disrupts things that are going on. Downtown Birmingham now has the issue with traffic, yeah. you know, with the construction. So you have those things that you have to take into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, and the Uber and the Lyft, they are kind of outsourcing that. Is there any chance that um, maybe some of the funds that are used for mass transportation in downtown could be used as like a waiver kind of thing for Ubers and Lyfts on a consistent basis? I guess there's a, that's a possibility. Is that in the, in the works? Or? That I'm not, I'm not familiar with. Mm. And, you know, I guess bringing everyone to the table that's involved in transportation just to see if that's feasible, mm. you know, that, that, that's a great idea. But I don't think anyone's actually sat down and brought that to the forefront. Well, even like if you did live downtown in an apartment complex and your work was maybe a few blocks away, um, and you were using, uh, had the assistance of a, a cane. Um, if there's uh, construction on the street that day that you're not familiar with or wasn't, you didn't hear about, I was at a meeting yesterday where they were talking about, um, for someone that was in a wheelchair, the ramp going up. Uh, there were three ramps that would help him get into his apartment and they were all within like a block and a half. Well, they had that construction on that street and there was really no way for him to get up onto the sidewalk. Um, so. A lot of the conversation yesterday was going to these these town meetings and these um, larger, um, you know, not conferences but meetings, and just making sure that these types of things are on people's minds when they go to. Uh, one of the things that they're saying is designing homes, building new homes. It only takes like one percent more uh, cost to make them fully accessible, uh, and you know, construction in downtown Birmingham also needs to do the same thing uh, with that. Mrs. Gates, what do you think about all this? I think that the best way to get people, like you just said, um, people don't realize that they block off stuff like that for people. They don't realize that people just need to be more considerate and kind of step back because when they first made the iPhones, me and Miss Dana have talked about this before, they didn't think about accessibility. Mm. When you're first in the works of making a project, you don't think, your first thought isn't, how can I make this accessible to everybody who needs it? And it's kind of just people have to step back and realize that you do have to make sure everything's accessible. And people, it's getting the word out because we always say that this agency so, it's kept a secret. So many people don't know about The best kept secret, yes. yeah. And you just have to get the word out because people, it's not people's fault that they don't know. Mm. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, okay, I would like to uh, talk about some examples at this point. Um, I would like to talk, uh, you know, some examples coming through blind services and then some examples about orientation and mobility specialists. Uh, Mrs. Barber, if you would give us an example of someone coming through um, blind services supports. Okay. Well, 
I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about how it worked for me. Mm. Uh, and and it, this is the design of the agency. We partner uh, in, with other rehabilitation programs or, or agencies across the state so that we can pool our resources to make all of the services to someone available. And that's one of the reasons we have such success in blind services. So we, someone comes in with a visual disability and they, they contact the, the counselor and then the counselor works with that person and so we'll say that person was me. Um, when I was in high school, just had graduated from high school, uh, about to enter the world of work back many, many years ago when I was not interested in all uh, of going to, to college, um, my parents were like, okay, well, how can we help? And so they started asking questions and they found the Alabama Department of Rehab Services and contacted, um, made contact and, and, and then, was, then I became a referral through the agency. And then they reached out to me and told me and my parents of everything that was available. And so that's what gets the ball rolling. And so then you start, if your goal is employment, you start working with that counselor and they talk to you and you set goals and they develop a plan of services and that plan of services includes uh, everything it will take to get you to your ultimate goal of, of, um, of employment. That could be setting you up with someone like Yolanda to teach you how to use a cane and I was taught how to use a cane. and. And, and then, then it, it might be helping you get set up with a university if you're going to go uh, the, the route of earning a college degree so that you can uh, become professionally employed. And that's what I did. And I, I also did not know how to use a computer, did not know about assistive technology. Um, and so I went to a residential rehabilitation program in Talladega at the Alabama Institute for Deaf and Blind. Their Gentry campus is for adults. And I went there and I learned how to use a computer with screen reading software. And I took a mobility class and I was taught by an orientation and mobility instructor how to use a cane and how to orient myself to my surroundings and how to get from point A to point B. I also took a course in Braille. So I learned how to read and write again. Um, and I was approaching the age of 40 at this time. I, um, uh, then I decided that college was the route that I wanted to go. and. So then I thought, okay, if I'm alone on a college campus, I think I could better navigate that campus if I had a service animal. Yeah. So I applied for and received a, a dog guide from Leader Dogs for the Blind out of Rochester, Michigan. So I trained with that guide dog and, and I came home from that training and I entered school and uh, fortunately had everything in place I needed to be successful through my college career and came out of that college career with a degree but with no work experience. Mm. Isn't that the, 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 like as soon as you get out of college you got to have 12 years experience. Yes, yes. And even though I was in my 40s I was just like a 22 year old who had graduated from college and had no work experience, no relevant work experience. Mm -hmm. And so this agency again then helped me with an a paid internship and um, the opportunity to network and then I was offered a position to work for the agency. So it's just a, combina a, a culmination of, of um, getting involved with the agency and taking advantage of the resources that are available to you through this agency and other programs to you know, reach your goal. 
Yeah, and I think it's really cool how you said there are services available for people um, for whatever goal they have. And through your story, I see that you, um, you know, reached out to uh, blind services here and you know, had that uh, orientation, um, finding out how to kind of uh, use the computer and stuff like that. Then maybe you didn't need it as much. And then you came back when you wanted to go to college. Then maybe you didn't need it as much. Then you came back when you were looking for employment. So it's not like a consistent, you know, you're working every day with blind services, but it, it's, it's here when you need us. Exactly, and always, and you can come back for, because with blindness, um, a lot of times those conditions are progressive. Mm. And when you start with the agency, there's things that you can do using your vision. And as your vision loss progresses, you may need services in a different way. Mm. So. Now, initially, when you had your orientation, what was that process like? And about how long did that take for you to feel comfortable using the, the computer, um, those types of things? Oh, it takes, a, it takes a while. And it takes a lot of, of um, using it with real applications. Mm -hmm to actually learn everything that you can do. And I still don't know everything that, that can be done. But, um, and, and as far as the orientation and mobility part, man, that's scary. Yeah. It can be very scary. How so? <laughs> well, just being out there with either a cane in front of you to tell you all the information that you need or a service dog. I mean, putting your trust in a dog. Yeah, I don't know if I'd put that yeah. in my puppy. Oh. <laughs> She's a nut. She sees a squirrel and I'm gone. <laughs> well, and they are trained. These dogs are professionally trained mm. to uh, ignore squirrels and... Um, you know, and most of the time they do, but what you have to remember is they are a dog first. Yeah. And so, but anyway, it's it's a scary process, but once you master it, it's it's great. Yeah. Um, and and dogs are more wonderful. I I love animals. I'm not an animal lover, but service animals are amazing. Mm. I think uh, my dog actually could read my schedule and memorize it. Uh, she would take me, if I just started on the route, it's like she took me right to the classroom door to the seat that I always sat in. Yeah. So they are very smart animals. She's like, no, Mom, we're going this way. It's this time of the day. Yes, what are you exactly, doing? Exactly. Um, but, you know, and there are advantages versus disadvantages with cane and dog. It's just your preference. What are some of those advantages and disadvantages? Well, with a cane, I don't care how many times I call it, it will not come to me. <laughs> with a dog, you know, you're like, come on, and they're right by your side. Yeah. You know. Um, but, of course, then you don't have to feed a cane. You don't have to take a cane to the vet. Uh, there's no shedding. Yeah. You know, there's... And, uh, it's just according to individual preference. Yeah, because there are areas and environments, like I'm a dog lover through and through, um, and I think that relationship, but there are environments where I wouldn't want to take my dog sometimes. Exactly. And there are environments where people don't want you to. Yeah. You know, so, you, and, and you know, if you travel with a dog, you got to put them in a, in a car. Mm. And there's conditions where it's cold or it's hot. Mm. You know, their feet are on the hot pavement. And so yeah. there's lots of considerations. That's very true. You got to be aware of that during the summer, especially don't keep your, your dog in the cars. And if you're outside, put some of those, like, you ever see those little gloves they have for yeah. them? Man, those things are so cute. The dogs hate them. They all walk for you. They kind of freak out. But if you don't, you know, especially down here in the South, that asphalt could reach, you know, pretty high temperatures and burn their feet, their, their paws there. So. It sure can. Um, now, Mrs. Smith, if you would give us an example, um, kind of through your experience as well. Okay. Um, let's see. Our agency, um, I mentioned that early on that I was an itinerant instructor, so I travel all of central Alabama, so I go out to the consumers' homes and, and workplaces and community. Um, our sister agency, I guess, um, or partner agency, AIBB, which is Alabama Institute Deaf Blind, um, they have a fairly new program that they started maybe about a year, two years now. Uh, it's called the Alabama Freedom Center for the Blind. Uh, it's located on the south side of Birmingham. Um, it's a residential program. Mm. And so and the applicants that are received into the program, instead of them receiving an itinerant instructor, they come into that program and they receive all of their blind adjustment training there at the residential facility. So they live there in the apartments. 
they receive instruction in cooking and cleaning, you know, accessing public transporta transportation. Uh, they receive instruction in Braille, uh, AT, computer, keyboarding. Um, so that's how that program works. Um, there was a student that uh, got accepted into the program. Uh, there is a application process. You have to be accepted. There are certain eligibility requirements, criteria, and things like that. But this particular student uh, came in from Georgia, uh, got accepted into the program. Um, Dana mentioned that it's sometimes it's scary, mm -hmm. and the student has attested to the fact that it, it was scary. That was a scary process for her to move from her family to Birmingham. All her family didn't come. I thought her whole family would, you know, was moving to Alabama. That's really scary. How old was she at that point? She was probably, she's probably in her 30s. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. you're still kind of branching out there. Yeah. Um, so she moved here um, to Birmingham and went through the process of learning all of the skills. Um, one thing about this particular program, it's called Structured Discovery. So all of your training is done under blindfold, whether you have some functional vision wow, um, or if you have no vision at all. Yeah. So you learn all of your skills and techniques under blindfold. Um, but this young lady went through the program. Um, had some hiccups along the way, some struggles along the way. I told my students, it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. You know, you're not going to learn all of these things overnight. Just wake up miraculously and say, oh, I know Braille. Well, what, are, what are some of the struggles that someone might um, have there? I think fear, you know, is probably primarily the biggest struggle that people have, you know, with it. It's the fear of the unknown, mm -hmm. you know. I have a lot of students that have age-related eye conditions. Um, I have students, diabetes, you know, when I think of diabetes, or it's a long time ago, you thought of perhaps losing a limb. That's what I think. Yeah, but uh, there's a diagnosis referred to as diabetic retinopathy, um, that you can lose your vision to, to, to diabetes. Uh, and there's uh, other tons of other medical considerations that you have to, that come into play, but um, this particular student, like I said, went through the program, uh, graduated from the program, and after graduation, uh, obtained employment through the Structured Discovery Program as a residential manager. Really? So she's doing really good. Yeah. And about how long was she in the school there? The program typically takes about nine months. Nine months. Six to, six to nine months to that particular program. So this lady had moved from Georgia to Alabama by herself, not with any family, totally unknown area, didn't you know, know many people, didn't have family around went to the school in Birmingham for about nine months to a year, uh, learned the skills that she needed to learn to empower herself to gain employment, and through that process, uh, became a residential manager. Through that program, yeah. And, and that's, a, that's a huge success. That is a great success. Um, is she, I'm guessing she's staying in Birmingham, or is she she's, thinking about going back to Georgia? She's still here. She's still here, yeah. I think she probably maybe six months into her new job. So. Congratulations to her. Yeah. I think that's great. <coughs> Excuse me. I'd like to talk a little bit about. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the employer and like college campuses. Or what is the? What's the biggest thing that you see for employment from the employer side? Like they just don't get. Or is there a hurdle there? Uh, Definitely. Yeah. To them, hiring someone who is blind is a huge liability. They're, because they just don't know or understand what the abilities are of the person. Uh, blindness is just a little hiccup, really. It's, it's uh, not anything that can't be overcome with the right skills and the right person, of course. But we have so many assistive technology devices that help us. And we're really no more of a liability than someone else as long as the right um, functions are in place for, for safety and security. Uh, we're more careful than, than most, than, than, than your common sighted person, actually. Uh, in, in my house, I'm the only one that has not fell down. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> you, you, They've, They've just, just got to realize what our capabilities are. And, and we have, we're the ones who have to prove that. Mm. So uh, just, just getting them past that fear. The fear of the unknown. That we though. may be hurt. Mm. Because we're, we're going to be care. careful. <laughs> and is that part of the orientation um, 
process there. Yes. So you would reach out to the employer? Well, that goes back to the counselors. Okay. Uh, we do have employment specialists. Hmm. So the employment specialists or the counselor will make a referral to that consumer once they're job ready to work with that employment specialist. And that employment specialist will sit down with that uh, client or consumer and they uh, help them with interviewing. Gotcha. They help them with uh, building their resume, um, you know, going back and forth with what that looks like, uh, taking them to uh, assist them with uh, clothing and things. So just making sure etiquette and proper things are in, in order before they have that very first interview and sitting across from that person. Yeah. Um, they bring me on board um, to assist them with, you know, when you walk into an interview, you know, being able to confidently shake that person's hand and be able to locate seating without soliciting assistance from the person. Um, but that, that's the gist of how that process works with employment as, as it relates to orientation and mobility. And a lot of businesses are also afraid of the cost of the accommodations for the person. And really the accommodation piece is minimal. And we also partner with um, the assistive technology department with the Alabama Department of, I mean with the Alabama Institute for Deaf and Blind and they come in and they assess the workplace for the accommodations mm -hmm. and make recommendations and usually the um, employers are, are pleasantly surprised yeah. at the minimal cost for the accommodations that someone would need for the position. What, uh, there's got to be some standards there, though, like regulations, government regulations, that it has to be accessible. But, um, you know, for someone in a wheelchair, but there are there standard regulations for people that have a vision loss? It's the same across the board, a reasonable accommodation. Mm. Just, and, and ours are really very reasonable. It's not, uh, you know, access is not the problem for us. It's, it's just, just the assistive the technology, technology that we need. I was in a uh, meeting, I think it was yesterday we were talking about that some employers are fearful of hiring somebody um, from like under ADMH that has a disability because this is more of developmental disability. Um, that they would have to call out sick more than somebody else. And what they found, the, the, the presenter said, uh, the numbers are that they actually call out less, that they're almost always on time, um, you know, and don't take days off. Your most dependable employees. Yes, I think that sums it up very well. I appreciate you saying that. Yes. Um, kind of a left turn here. There are blind and deaf schools, and I was, we had the opportunity to speak with James Myrick and Curtis Gleason down in Montgomery a few weeks ago. We talked about this then, too. Um, there are blind and deaf schools, and in these schools, everybody that goes to that school as a student is blind or deaf. Now, you don't see those schools for intellectual disability or developmental disability. There's a really big push for integration in uh, public schools in the same classroom. But when I see or I, I hear that there's a blind and deaf school, that says kind of the opposite of integration. What do you think about that? I think it's totally individualized. I think that we have both options because no, no one is alike. So it's just according to what your, your need and your, your preference. Um, one size doesn't fit. <laughs> I didn't know if they were pushing to maybe um, integrate the blind and deaf schools more into the public school system, but I don't see, I don't see that happening. I don't see that happening either. Um, and there are advantages to going to the Alabama School for the Blind. Um, at the Alabama School for the Blind, they have amazing assistive technology training. And although we have teachers of the visually impaired who are in our public school systems, they're not always highly trained on teaching the use of those assistive technology devices. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a disadvantage of going to the Alabama School for the Blind is that you would have to relocate to live there. Mm -hmm. So everybody doesn't want that for their family member or for themselves. So, so it's, it's an option, and it's a great option. I, I'm excited that we have both. Any other thoughts on that? 
you know, just ditto what Dana said. You know, I, I, you talk about inclusion. You know, they they do try to include them, but um, like I said, the TVIs, which are teacher for visually impaired, um, they aren't equipped um, for the most part to. To, to teach those specialized skills that they need for when they do get ready to come out into real world, you know, they have the necessary tools and things that they need to be independent. Um, they get that more specialized one-on-one -on -one when they're in the environment um, at a school for the blind. And a lot of students do both. They may spend a couple of years at the Alabama School for the Blind and then they may transfer to a, a public high school. So, See, I think that mix would be great. I, uh, my other aunt is a special ed teacher in Georgia, and um, she says that there's a really big push for inclusion in the regular school, uh, regular classroom, but she thinks that kind of the best mix would be 25% um, one-on-one -on -one individualized and 75% using those skills that, you, that that person's learned uh, in, the, in the regular classroom. Yeah, in the, in the I can classroom. say that. So I think there's some changes going on right now, you know, where they're kind of settling in uh, in the education system. So. <clears throat> uh, let me check my notes here. What is kind of the greatest opportunity for long-term return um, if someone is experiencing vision loss that you would always say, oh my gosh, this person has to do this. This will pay off dividends for you over the next 30 years. What would that be? just to become a part of this system in the beginning and take advantage of all the services that we have to offer and be motivated yourself. We can't do it all for someone. They have to be proactive in their, in their training, in their service plan. So just to, that personal motivation, dedication, drive, all that has to exist within the person for them to be successful um, currently and then in the future. So you just you got to do your part. Yeah. I think sometimes maybe people think, oh, well, if, I'm, if I go to this organization, they'll make everything better. Yeah. We don't have jobs that we can just pull out of our drawer and walk in and say, oh, here's your job. We don't have that. Um, and, and, you know, we're not an entitlement program. We expect that when you come in we're going to do everything we can to help you but you've got to help yourself mm. i think that carries a lot of weight I think so. yeah. and that's even uh, um as you were sharing your story about um you and mary working together you know that was that was something that you you know built with your relationships there yes you know yes um okay is there um we're kind of getting a little bit toward the end here of the broadcast. <coughs> and we do have a little bit of a cellular on and off there. But, um, is there anything important that we really haven't talked about that you guys think we should be talking about? I am not as familiar about the blind community as I am about intellectual and developmental disability just because my family experience. Um, but what are some things that we haven't talked about that we should be? Because there's just so much that's out there, resources that are out there that people may not be aware of. Mm -hmm. um, I think just getting connected, that's really important. Um, I, I can teach my students, and I tell them this, I can teach you from the textbook what you're supposed to learn about orientation mobility, how to safely cross the street, you know, how to use the transportation, you know, how to use your cane safely, go up steps, things of that nature. But I think I'm a big, I, I love, partnering peer support i love peer support mm. for students um connecting them with someone else that have similar likes similar interests um that they can talk to um, once they go through our program they're going to eventually graduate i'll give them a certificate of completion we've done everything based on your goals and objectives and you've demonstrated that you're capable of using this but you have to use it mm. you know you just can't put that cane in the closet yeah and uh, you know I guess you can, but, you know, that, that puts you back to where you started. Um, but I think just once you get connected with the right people, just continue with that. There are lots of national organizations that have local chapters or state chapters, National Federation of the Blind. Um, 
Alabama Council of the Blind, getting connected with those organizations where you learn about you're engulfed or immersed in everything as it relates to blindness, technology, you know, the new, the next newest and greatest thing that's happening. You learn about those things. Go to those meetings, go to those groups. Uh, be a part of a family, of a community of people. Mm -hmm. um, I attend Church of the Highlands, and um, our pastor teaches us to know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. I somehow find a way to incorporate that into my students' plan, you know, towards the, when it's time for us to get ready to go to that next step. This is what you guys have to do. I can't do it for you. And I think that's just profound, you know, and so... If, if they don't do anything else, I think it's them staying connected once they've left our agency, mm. staying connected with other folks. And I'll tell you just some specifics about some of the programs that we have for, for youth, especially. Uh, this time of the year, our children are getting ready to um, graduate from high school, and we have transition programs for them. And these programs, they're called Transition Day events, and we have four of them regionally across the state. And these programs are specifically designed for students from 8th through 12th grade, their parents, and the teachers of the visually impaired who work with them in the school systems. And we bring them in and we, we design the program around something that's relevant to them. Uh, it's been Heroes Academy and it, it um, you know, I'm not real into all the pop culture stuff, but some people that I work with are. And so they, do, they design these programs that are fun and relevant for the students. The Game of Thrones but, transition. Exactly, exactly. And, and we, um, it's all about transitioning from high school to work or transitioning from high school to college. And so then at these events, we're bringing students together who don't know each other because they're from different schools and different cities. And so they come together and they get to know each other, and that helps. We also have a summer work program for our students who are in high school or college. And during the summer, they can work for up to, up to 40 hours a week up for up to six weeks. And uh, our agency actually pays their salary. Really? A minimum wage. And, you know, that's a win-win yeah. for the student and for the employer. And it's also a huge awareness tool for employers. Yeah. Um, so we do that program, and that helps that student have paid work experience to start a resume. Mm -hmm. And, oh, it teaches them the soft skills that they need. Now, you guys already booked up for this coming summer for that program? That program is underway now. We, uh, As a matter of fact, I just spoke with the employment development developer here before we started this interview and she was telling me that they've already did their orientation session <laughs> and they're doing interviews right now and they'll be ready to start work uh, the first week in June. Uh, where is that class or where is that program? Is it located here in Birmingham? It is a statewide program mm. but yes Birmingham does have a program in this area and the, the counselors do that for their, their the people in their caseloads who are who are in high school or college. We should, do like a, we should do a live broadcast from like a training session there. That would be awesome. That would be cool. So that would be awesome. Yeah. And then we have a college prep program for our students who are blind or have low vision. And it's called College Quest. And it is in its second year. And this year that program will be from June 15th through June 28th. We partner with the Alabama Institute for Deaf and Blind. The AIDT, Alabama Industrial Training Training Development, and the Alabama Department of Commerce and Auburn University mm. to put on this program. It's held on the campus of Auburn University. And then we also have, for the first time, we're about to run a pilot program this year for an ACT prep for students who are blind. Yeah. So it, everything we do is to prepare them for work. Mm. It's and you know you, we start young, right? We have to we start, and we have a huge focus on preparing our young people. Well, uh, even though it's it really focused on work, a lot of the programs I do see, just from the feeling I'm getting, is a lot of it is uh, training people how to be self advocates and empowering them. Yes. <clears throat> because even though you go through a program, it's ultimately up to you to finish the job. 
definitely. Just, Just like, like anybody, anybody else. Yeah. yeah. Um, Mrs. Gates, um, is there anything you'd like to say to, uh, from your experience, um, to maybe somebody that is thinking about getting involved in blind services or helping people, maybe a little fearful, um, just kind of. I just, I can't imagine my life without it. I have completely fallen in love with the whole entire agency and it's so hard not to because they do so much, you just name so much stuff that we Yeah, it's like a pack summer. summer, it was really yes. cool. And, I mean, Thor's transition plan. It is just, you see it change people's lives and you hear people come back with success stories and I've heard so many just the short time that I've been here and it's amazing just to just to hear how much it's helped people and personally it's helped me i know what i want to do now that i've been here i want to further my education and become a professional in this agency and i just i don't know how somebody couldn't fall in love with it i love how you say that it's helped you or you know made a really big impression on you mm -hmm. um <clears throat> we sat with um keith richards of tzatziki's mediterranean restaurant originally when we started doing broadcast and uh, he's got like a hundred stores across the U.S. now, and quite a bit in Alabama. And he employs about two people with a disability per store for about 50 stores. And he said from the employer standpoint, a lot of employers are fearful, but what you find is it totally transitions the entire team. It becomes more of a family atmosphere. Um, and I think you kind of hit that on the head is the difference it's made in your life, just being a part of the community and, and really you know, being there. So I would encourage anybody that, you know, is thinking about it to jump in. Definitely. At least learn about it. Mm. Just to know what we do. Because a lot of people don't. I've said that before. That a lot of people don't know what we do. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's so interesting. It's so intriguing to learn more about. Now, are there uh, volunteering opportunities for people? Any upcoming volunteering or things like that? We have... Um, in, in 2020, we will have a technology symposium, and this symposium is uh, usually done every year. Um, they've decided to go to an every other year um, design for this, but we could, at events like that, um, we could use anyone who wanted to volunteer. We would not turn them down. Yeah. Um, Give them a shirt. Put them over there. I love free t-shirts. Yeah. And Yolanda is going to be, uh, uh, it, she's over designing a white cane day. Every year on October 15th, that is recognized as white cane day. And it's all about the awareness of the white cane. And you want to tell them about that and how maybe they can volunteer? Yeah, we've been doing that since 2013. Um, uh, white, white cane safety awareness, like Dana said, it's celebrated October 15th of each year. It's to bring awareness to the white cane. Um, there's a law that says that if you see someone standing at the intersection with a cane, they're at the crosswalk, that they have the right of way. No matter what. No matter what, they have the right of way. Wait a second, even if the light's green? <laughs> <laughs> they're not going to go when it's green. We actually, going back to the, some of the skills that we teach, Yeah. Um, we teach our students to stand there at that intersection and to listen to traffic patterns. Mm. We analyze the traffic. But before we just throw you out there and make your process. Yeah, <laughs> here's the white cane just start walking around. <laughs> Everybody will stop. <laughs> not always how it'll happen. Exactly. I mean, you can't throw that cane in the air and it'll make the traffic stop. Yeah, <laughs> that's the magic wand. Yeah, there you go. But um, yeah, we, we teach students those skills. They build up to those skills. Mm. Uh, crossing the street, um, crossing the street in a residential area in a, a busy uh, business district. So there's all, there's a method to the madness. I tell my students all the time. Um, but going back to the law, the law says that if someone's standing there with a guide dog or someone sitting there with a white cane, that person has the law or has the right of way to cross. Um, each the first year it was held in Birmingham. This year it's going to be up in Muscle Shoals. Um, every metropolitan city in the state of Alabama. They've had it at Montgomery and Mobile, and so it's just it, every area just takes turns hosting the site. But normally there's a symbolic walk associated with it. There's vendors, there's food, there's entertainment. Uh, it's a statewide event, so folks come from all over the state um, to participate in that, that event. Um, there are proclamations that are read, um, and it's just a fun, you know, Event. Fun atmosphere. Exactly, but again, ultimately, the it's to bring awareness to the white cane. Mm -hmm. um, 
2020, Dana mentioned 2020 for what she has geared up. Uh, 2020, uh, we're looking to do something special uh, for 2020 White Cane. Um, it's going to come back here to Birmingham, so we're looking to do something special. So stay tuned. Nice. Stay safe. Yeah. Yeah. So anyone who wants to volunteer with anything we do, we can use them. We can use them. Yeah. We'll put them to work. <laughs> now, we're, um, what's the best way to get in contact with you guys, either if I'm looking for services or if I want to volunteer? There's a toll-free number. Um, it's 1-800-441-7607. And that's the contact number. Uh, you let us know where you're calling from, and we'll get you connected to the respective uh, state offices. So that's a statewide number, and then from there, you'll be kind of, if you're in Birmingham, you'll be directed here. You'll be connected. Yeah. And we also have a website, rehab.alabama.gov. Rehab.alabama.gov. And Facebook as well? Yes, we have a Facebook page. And what would be the name of the Facebook page? Um, it's just Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Um, well, we're coming, uh, we're going to wrap it up here shortly, but is there anything that you would like to say to the audience? If you're having difficulty with vision loss, or you have a family member who is having difficulty with vision loss, contact us. We can help. All you've got to do is reach out. Just take that first step, pick up the phone. Yeah, don't sit there and twiddle your thumbs, because we're here to help. Yeah. I, I did know what Dana said, you know, just pretty much we're here, we're available. Uh, this is what we do all day. Um, Come to the experts. Don't, don't always try and figure everything out on your own. That's very good that you're trying to do that. That's, that shows the motivation, but um, reach out. You don't have to do it alone. Mm -hmm. Make that connection, exactly. Mm -hmm. And if you're sodded, um, learn more. Learn more about it. Even mm. if it doesn't, if you don't know anybody who is visually impaired or blind, it's just so interesting to get to learn about. So, and, and there's a lot of career opportunities. A lot. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Employment, employment, employment. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, very good. I, I just want to say um, thank you all for being on, on the show with me today. I've really enjoyed our, our time spent together. Um, and at this point, I am going to go ahead and stop the stream. Um, and for everybody watching, we will be live next Wednesday and Thursday. I cannot remember the guests, but if you're interested, uh, go to the uh, alabamacare.org and sign up at the weekly email. And we're going to start doing those on like Sunday evening. I'm going to start sending them out and I'm not going to miss any of the broadcasts on them. So, um, but thank you for being here with us. And I hope you guys really enjoyed our, our guest today. I, I did. So I will see you. Thank you. I will see you guys next week.